My name is Marie Cruz, and I'm co-chair of the Art Program Committee. And I wish to welcome members and guests and visitors today. The mission of the club is to strengthen our community through learning, giving, and sharing our landmark building. And all of us have been to libraries, I'm sure, to look at and borrow books, but have you noticed the various pieces of art there? I have not always, so I've gone to sometimes when the new, there's new art in the gallery, I've stopped by. Well, today we have Jeremy Andrakowski, who is presently Director of Finance at the Oak Park Public Library, and he's going to talk about the permanent art collection. He is not an artist. He is the director, he was the director of operations where he, where he supervised the permanent art collection for the library, focusing on maintaining current appraisal value, insurance, and protection. He, Jeremy, has over 20 years of public library experience and is a proficient research librarian. He has been in our library four years, is that correct? Great. And he has a strong appreciation for art and enjoys the outdoors and travel. And he's hoping to go to Greece and look at the artwork there <laughs> in the fall. So welcome, Jeremy. Very good. Thank you all for having me here. Um, as as uh, Marie noted that I'm not an art historian although I know we have some in the, in the audience as well. So hopefully we can give you a good overview of what we have at the public library and um, some interesting tidbits in some of the artists that we have here. So one of the things that I think is um, not unique but special about the Oak Park Public Library is the art collection. Some people might think, what's the art doing in the library? And um, I've worked in libraries where they're no art at all, one piece, that kind of thing. But I think it really ties in um, with art for the public good. It's one of the unique institutions where anybody can come in there anytime you're open and they have full access to everything. And that's something that I think is special about uh, the library being a, a steward of art. It also ties in closely with the library's strategic priorities with the mission and the vision for the community here in Oak Park. Now we have three branches. Um, there's the Dole Branch, the Mays Branch, and the main library here, right two blocks away. Um, so I think that's one of the things that, um, looking at each location has something special to offer for people coming in there. So at the Dole Branch, through a partnership with the Park District. We lease the space there from them. We have uh, a multicultural collection. This was a collection that was donated to the library um, by District 97. Uh, it's a collection, it has about 100 items in there, come with little cards that talk a little bit about what the item is, and you can actually check those out. That's a great opportunity for learning about different cultures. Um, tells a little story about it. I know one piece when I was there is a little tapestry that was hand stitched by a, a refugee that had come after the Vietnam War. And it was basically the story of her journey coming to the United States. So it's a great way to explore cultures, um, understand different identities and build empathy. So if you're ever in, that area, stop in the Dole and take a look at some of their collection there. We also have the Mays Branch, which is down on the southeast side, um, just north of uh, 290 there. Um, this painting here, um, let me get you a better photo, is the Poet's Home, and this is by Carl Kraft. This is the one piece that we have at the Mays Branch and uh, I was talking to somebody down there earlier and um, they were showing the Carl Craft that we have here at, uh, or you have, at the 19th Century Club. 
interesting and to note, I was doing some research on this and the piece you have down in the, on the second floor there has a thumbprint between his first name and last name. And through my research, they were talking about Carl Kraft was a very prolific painter. So he had a lot of paintings going on. And um, during that time, people said, okay, there's a market for that, those Carl Kraft paintings. And so they were duplicating it. So he started putting the thumbprint on there uh, to identify that these were re really his and they weren't a knockoff. So this painting here is one that I like. I particularly like um, some of the detail work in there. Carl Kraft was born in Ohio, moved to Illinois. Uh, he did have his first studio in Oak Park. He was educated at the Art Institute of Chicago and he traveled all throughout the, um, down Missouri, the Ozarks, up to New York. And he started a lot of the uh, art colonies um, wherever he went. So while in the Ozarks, he and uh, Rudolf Inger created a major art colony, the Society of the Ozark Painters. And I'll show you a piece from that period when he was in. So I like looking at the detail when I get in there, um, give you a little better view of some of the, I like the little character with the dog reaching out to pet the dog. He was a member of artist groups such as the Palette and Chisel Club. Uh, he was a founder, including the Municipal Art League and the Art League of Oak Park. And he did uh, pass away in 1938 here in Oak Park. This image, this is not, the library does not own this one. I just, I was through my research, I give you an idea of some of the other stuff that he does. Most of his paintings were kind of pastoral um, nature scene. So I thought this one was really good. This was called Charm of the Ozark. It was his first work in the Ozarks. And it was exhibited in 1916 at the Art Institute of Chicago and won him an award. So he had the Dole Branch, um, Maze Branch, just the one piece at the Maze, and then we have the main library. And at the main library, we have a special collections room, if you're not familiar with that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. We have the Benin bronze sculpture replicas and that we just got out on display a couple years ago. So you can see those on the third floor. We have the public art gallery, which rotates exhibits periodically. And uh, then we have the fine art. So I'll go briefly through the first three and then we can talk a little bit more uh, what's in there. So in the special collections, we have um, a lot of Hemingway artifacts. This here is letter on the letter on the left is a school paper that he was writing. And then in the center is a letter, original letter uh, to the person named Sue, where he's talking about one of his books that he's written. Um, we have films, um, photographies, original drawings from Frank Lloyd Wright, um, Edgar Rice Burroughs, original copies, and a lot of other things like that. Now, you can get in and see some of that, just need to set up an appointment to go in and visit the library to see some of those things. And then we have the Ben and Bronze sculptures. This was part of the multicultural collection that we had when I came in and they were stuck down in a storage behind some shelving. And so through our uh, conversations with the librarian, uh, the multicultural librarian at the time, we decided this was, we need to get these out even replicas to talk about it. Um, so we put those out on display. If you, in the main library on the third floor, you can see those from, there's artwork that you'll see down in the, in the end uh, that flows from the south end of the building all the way to the north to the special collections room. So you can take a look at some of those. These replicas um, were uh, part of the Ben and Bronze, or from the Ben and Bronze collection these two pieces, um, you'll see the one on the left is at the British Museum and the one on the right is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This collection was really from the Benin Bronze uh, Kingdom, or the Benin Kingdom, pardon me. Uh, and it was dated, in, it's currently in what's Nigeria. And um, through the disc the, the British Museum acquired a lot of these things through different things, through donations and things like that. So there is some discussion about returning the original pieces back to Nigeria, 
but there's some work to be hashed out on that as far as um, curating and, and stewardship on that. But, and then w with our, with our um, public gallery, this is a gallery on the second floor, and this does change periodically every month or two, and you'll see artists, local artists, display their work. Uh, this is the current exhibit up there now. Um, there's some amazing art, and like I said, it changes. So anytime you're in the library, take a look at the second floor and walk through. Um, they do have receptions for the artists when they put that out there as well. And then we come to the fine art. And so this piece uh, is one of the highlights of the library, a uh, piece by Kahinde Wiley. Uh, it's called Easter Realness Number no. 2, as you can imagine. There's a series of Easter Realness paintings. Um, he's born in Los Angeles uh, to a Nigerian father and African-American mother. He took to art when he was young and um, studied at, uh, he got his Bachelor of Fine Arts from San Francisco Art Institute and his Master of Fine Arts from Yale. His first exhibit was here in Chicago called Pas Passing and Posing um, at the Hoffman Gallery. Wiley came, became notary, um, well known as he started uh, doing portraits of hip hop artists. And of course, the president. The library does not own this piece, that question that came up. Um, but if you were fortunate to see that down in, um, at the Art Institute when it came through, it's an amazing painting. The Wiley, the Easter Realness number two, just to give you an idea of perspective, and if you've seen this, in live too. These are big pieces. The Easter Realness number two is nine feet tall and nine feet wide. Uh, and that is accessible um, on the third floor on the south end of the building. So you can just go through there and take a peek at it. Um, we also have this piece here by Jacob Hashimoto. This is um, called Skip, Skitter, Start, Trip, Vault, Bounce, and Other Attempts at Flight. This two piece is about eight feet by 12 feet on the second floor. It's made of many suspended little kites and um, you'll hang them out different distances to make a three dimensional image. He uses sculpture, painting and installation, it creates complex worlds, range from mod modular components, bamboo and paper kites, um, his, his compositions reference video games. And this is from his website, Virtual Environments, Cosmology. Also deeply rooted in art historical traditions, notably, notably landscape-based abstraction, modernism, and handcrafts. Uh, he was a student at the School of the Art Institute Chicago. And we were fortunate to have Mr. Hashimoto out in 2021 to do some repair on this work. So he did uh, created some new kites and untangled some of the, the string hangings. During that time, he had an exhibit at the Rona Hoffman Gallery in Chicago. And then I was actually in Portland after he came out and visit. I was port in Portland at the airport having a coffee and look up on the ceiling and um, I was like, that's gotta be one of his, his pieces. And it just flows along the ceiling there. He's also done some pieces um, at the Willis Tower. And, uh, and the one at the Willis Tower has 7,000 individual kite-like discs that um, flow along the, the ceiling there. This piece was made by a local artist, TA2. This is actually at the out front of the, the Dole Branch. And this was a, a collage, kind of a sculpture that she worked on with some of the teens in the area to help them participate in their summer volunteer program. She's got a studio here on Harrison Street uh, in the Oak Park Arts District. And it's created murals along the Green Line in Oak Park, the Arts, Arts District, as well as other outdoor sculptures. This is a photo of Tia Etu with her studio. 
called with her painting called The Call, as a 2022. Uh, this was exhibited in the library's idea box, right? As you come into the main library there, there's a little exhibit room there, and that changes often. The Call is a Juneteenth-inspired work that was commissioned for the library's permanent art collection. Uh, she named this work The Call uh, to refer to the owl calls that Harriet Tubman would make to let enslaved people know it was safe to move through the Underground Railroad in the 1800s. Um, she found her love for art in middle school growing up on the South Side in Chatham. Uh, she attended Art Institute in Chicago and moved to Oak Park in 1984. This is a color photograph. Um, this is 60 by 60 inches, so five feet square. Um, called A View from the Bridge by Tom Palazzo, Palazzolo, excuse me. Um, once dubbed Chicago's filmmaker laureate by Roger Ebert. Palazzolo um, is an experimental film, filmmaker, photographer, and painter whose work largely document local Chicago life and issues in American politics. Although the subjects of this film vary widely, they're all united in the humanistic depiction of those living on the margins of society. On the surface, Tom's film tend to present a humorous, offbeat, even dry tones, revealing easily overlooked ways of life, historical phenomena, and a closer look to re reveal the modus operandi using humor to reveal, explain, or take a look at something that's much more often complex. His films have been featured in the Gene Siskel Film Center, Cannes Film Festival, and the Whitney Museum for American Art, amongst many others. Here's a photo of Mr. Palazzolo. Um, for four decades, he was a purveyor of affectionate, poignant, and dark musings on Chicago's urban landscapes. Um, this is a releasing um, a feature three films representing different eras of his work. Tom is a longtime Oak Park resident and has continued making and showing documenting films right up to the present, including a portrait of homeless street artist Lee Gody, currently in the works. In 2018, his work was part of the American or the Art Institute of Chicago's Never a Lovely So Real Photography and Film in Chicago, 1950 through 1980. This is a piece the library has in one of its study studios by Jonathan Franklin called Bookmakers. It's oil on canvas um, from 2004. Jonathan Franklin was born in Michigan, some an engineer, uh, spent much of his childhood in Vietnam, Bangladesh, and Indonesia. After studying art at the University of Michigan, he moved to Israel where he lived in a kibbutz and began painting and working as a printmaker. He also served in the Israeli, Ar Israeli army. He's a teaching artist in public schools and has worked in theater both as a set designer and performer. He's been a visual artist for over 45 years and does live in Oak Park. Jonathan's murals can be found throughout the village, including this one titled Rush Hour, located near I-290 Ramp on Austin. Originally, uh, this was painted on a seven by four and a half foot canvas and then re-imaged and printed on a 30 by 15 foot vinyl sheet. The Oak Park Arts Council Mini Mural Program. Jonathan has over a dozen murals along the Metro CTA line, Green Line walls as well. This is a uh, charcoal and acrylic on paper by Jesse Howard called Rennie and Rhapsody from 2017. Since the 80s, Jesse Howard's socially concerned drawings have focused on the plight of the homeless and disenfranchised, particularly African Americans and urban environments. Informed by his own unsettling upbringing in Chicago's West Side and his lived experience as a black man, Howard is sensitive to the way these populations are viewed, treated, and often dismissed. 
produced in charcoal, watercolor, and collage. His figures are typically distorted, reflecting the pressure and anxiety the individual feels, as well as the perceptions and expectations imposed upon them by society. In addition, the physical presence of the urban life is often evident through bits of newspapers, receipts, or other various scraps affixed to the surface of the portraits. Jesse Howard received his Bachelor of Science degree from Ball State University. His artwork is included in permanent art co collections at DePaul University, um, Beloit College, Minnesota Museum of American Art, and Rutgers University. He's received numerous awards, um, including uh, first place at the 58th Annual Beloit and Vicinity Exhibition and the Ragdale Foundation Residency Scholastic Award. Most recently in 2021, his work was included in group exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, The Long Dream, curated by Carla Acevedo Yates and Naomi Beckwith. Although a resident of nearby Maywood, Jesse frequents the Oak Park Public Library and is a patron where, where he can be found working on his portfolio in the computer lab or at the reference desk seeking help from the library staff. In 2022, the library hosted an exhibition from Jesse, um, his advanced drawings of, it, of his advanced drawing students from the Oak Park Art League where he currently teaches. So this is the public gallery where he was displayed. These two pieces, there's a, there's a third as well. Um, the one on the left is Branford B, episode number two. And the one on the right is Building Stories, 1923 to 2003 by Chris Ware. Chris Ware was born in Omaha in 1967, he currently lives and works from his home studio in Oak Park. Known for his New Yorker magazine style covers, he's hailed as a master of comic art form. Um, his complex graphic novels tell stories about people in suburban Midwestern neighborhoods, poignantly reflecting on the role memory plays in uh, constructing identity. Stories feature many of Ware's protagonists, Quimby the Mouse, Rusty Brown, and Jimmy Corrigan. Often appear in serialized form in, in the New York Times, The Guardian, um, or Ware's own ongoing comic book series, Acme Novelty Library. In 2020, Ware was des designed the covers of April 6th and May 4th issues in New Yorker both reflecting life during the onset of the coronavirus pandemic. He's a cartoonist whose work has been exhibited at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York City, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, and his graphic novel, Jimmy Corrigan, The Smartest Kid on Earth, won the Guardian Prize in 2000. In 2000. Um, he has contributed over 25 covers to The New Yorker. These are two of three pieces. The one on the left um, is called Jump Rope. These are linocut prints. And the one on the right is Mother and Child. The artist is Margaret Burroughs. Uh, also known as Margaret Taylor Ghost, Margaret Taylor Ghost Burroughs, or Margaret T.G. Burroughs. African-American artist and writer and co-founder of the DuSable Museum of African-American History. She also helped establish Southside Community Art Center, um, whose opening on May 1st, 1941, was dedicated by the First Lady of the United States, Eleanor Roosevelt. There at the age of 23, Burroughs served as the youngest member of its board of directors. She was a prolific writer, and her efforts directed towards the exploitation of the black experience and the children especially to their appreciation of their cultural identity and their introduction to growing awareness of art. These two pieces are in the children's department in the library. There's a 
photo of Margaret was an artist herself who captured the life of children in the African American community in a very positive way. Her fame never affected promoting the young artist in every artistic discipline um, that was retrieved from her website. This sculpture is uh, hard to miss when you walk into the main library in the, in the front there. Um, this is by Carol Harrison, entitled Unity and Growth from 1966, made of brass and copper. Carol Harrison was born in Chicago, a practicing artist working in mediums of both cast and welded metals, as well as drawing and painting. Carol began her training at the sculpture at Monticello College at Alton, and she earned her Bachelor of Fine Arts and a Master of Fine Arts Sculpture at the Cranbrook Academy of Art in Bloom Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Upon completion of her studies um, at Cranbrook, she was the recipient of a Fulbright, Fulbright Fellowship for study in sculpture at the Central School of Arts and Crafts in London, and the Louis Comfort Tiffany Foundation grant, and she was also included in the Contemporary American Women Sculptures. Over a lifetime, she produced pieces that are on display in permanent art collections throughout the United States, including the Oak Park Public Library. This piece is uh, Higgins Glass, it's mobile. It's 337 pieces, and since I've been here, this has been reworked by the Higgins Art Studio. Uh, it's basically 96 inches wide and tall. Um, this you can see as you walk into the main library going up the stairs, um, look up to the skylight and you'll see it hanging there. Michael and Francis Higgins met in Chicago at the Chicago Institute of Design. They were pioneers in rediscovery and refinement of the ancient art of glass fusing. Originally, the studio operated out of their apartment. They had a kiln set up behind their sofa. Um, they make everyday items as, such as bowls, plates, and they're transformed through their arresting mix of geometric and curved lines, bold use of colors into objects useful, yet visually vibrant and exciting. Uh, their studio currently is um, down at Riverside, and when they were reworking this, I had the opportunity to go there, and it's just amazing to, if you get a chance to go visit. Uh, they do have kind of a, a storefront where you can go shop everything from ornaments to bowls and wall hangings. These are two more of the pieces that they have. As you walk into the main library, you'll see it hanging on the, on the left side in the window so you can see through the glass and see all the colors brightly. This piece by Jonathan Winslow is called The Fog Pr Frog Prints, 2002. It's oil on canvas. Um, he received his Bachelor of Arts, ba Bachelor of Art in Architecture at Princeton and her earned his Bachelor of Fine Arts and Master of Fine Arts in Painting at Yale. His memorable paintings are a jumble of figures and objects moving improbably through space, referred to as a realistic illusionist who creates a narrative into an alternative universe of open-ended possibilities and improbable non-linear connections. Um, he has private, uh, his numerous public and private collections, including New Orleans Museum of Art, New Orleans uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, uh, Yale University, and the Metropolitan Opera Lincoln Center. These are two of three pieces that we have um, from Richard Loving. The one on the left is Almost Together, Oil on Canvas, uh, and the one on the right is Incitation, again, Oil on Canvas. Richard Loving is an American artist and educator primarily based in Chicago, gained res recognition in the 80s as a member of the Elusive Abstractionists an informal group of Chicago painters whose individual forms of organic abstraction embraced evocative imagery and metaphor counter to the dominant minimalist mode. 
Um, in 2010, critic James Ude uh, wrote that Loving's work mold over the possibilities of patterns and representation of narrative and allegory to attain a kind of wisdom, transcendence, and acknowledgement of universals, seeking the understanding of self within the poetics of the physical world. His work has been exhibited at the Art Institute of Chicago, the Museum of Contemporary Crafts in New York, the Block Museum of Art, Hyde Park Art Center, Brower Museum of Art. His work belongs to the public collections, the Art Institute in Chicago, and many others. Um, he has a, long lived in Oak Park, where he passed away uh, this in March of 2021. This is a piece by Dan Gustin, Hope and Discovery. It's oil on canvas, um, 87 by 78 inches, so another large piece. This piece you can see right as you walk in the main library in the lobby there on the right. Um, Dan Gustin's been an associate pre professor at the Art, of, Art School of Art Institute of Chicago since 1984. He's been a visiting artist for many years at the International School of Art in Umbria, Italy received a Master of Fine Arts at Yale, and his Bachelor of Fine Art at Kansas City Art, Muse Art Institute. He spends his summers painting and teaching near his home in Umbria, Italy. While there, he paints landscapes, often working on three or four paintings a day. During the rest of the year, he's an Associate Professor of Art at the Art Institute of Chicago. While home in Chicago, uh, the artist focuses on his large-scale narratives. This is a piece called Sobre Todo, Above All Else by Emilio Lobato. It's oil and collage on a panel uh, from 2003. Emilio Lobato III was born in San Pablo, a farming village in uh, Southern Colorado. Interested in reducing his subjects to essential elements, Lobato uses shapes, light, and color to convey the spirit of the world around him. He received his Bachelor of Arts from the Colorado College. Um, his work resides in numerous collections, including the Kirkland Museum, Denver Art Museum, the National Hispanic Cultural Center in New Mexico, and the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center. Uh, they had a retrospective of Lobato's work in 2011 entitled Melinda Soledad. This piece is called The Great Skate by T.L. Solian, uh, oil on enamel on canvas uh, from 2003. Expresses, expressive color and imaginative imagery abound in T.L. Solian's provocative paintings, drawings, and mixed media cutouts. A self-described artist on the, of the absurdist cultural critique, he's concerned with contemporary collapse of our culture engaging in often paradoxical narratives uh, constructed with references to a Scandinavian heritage. Um, born in Fargo, North Dakota, in 1949, he earned his Bachelor of Fine Arts from Moorhead State University and his Master of Fine Arts painting and sculpture from the University of Nebraska. He's a recipient of many honors and awards, including the Whitney, Whitney Biennial Exhibition and the Joan Mitchell Foundation Fellowship in Painting. Selected collections include Metropolitan Museum of Art, Whitney Museum of American Art, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and the Art Institute of Chicago, amongst many others. He's currently a tenured professor in the art department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and has been a member of that faculty since 1997. This piece entitled Core of Discovery was painted by Marcus Kenny. He's born and raised in rural Louisiana and lives and works in Savannah, Georgia. Earned his Master of Fine Arts in Photography from the Savannah College of Art and Design. And he works in many mediums, including sculpture, painting, and photography, and neon. 
when interviewed by Telfair Jepson Center for the Arts about calling his art like paintings, he says he's confident he could paint all the, the details, but why? I could do all this with paint, but, but what I like about my process is that the materials have been touched by many hands, not just my own. I'll give you a little close up view. When I look at artwork, wherever I'm at, I like getting up close. I know it's difficult to see here, so I'm zoom in a little bit. Um, but you can see these are little stamps that he has. Um, you can see the brush strokes where he's painted the components, but then you can see their actual physical stamps as well. And then when I think about that, connecting the other hands that have touched his work. And so this too is on display on the third floor, um, just near the silent reading room now. So you can get up close and really take a quick look at it or get a good look at it and see all the different kinds of stamps. Um, and then you can step back again and hopefully you have a, a new perspective on that as well. So that's just a few of the pieces that we have. We have, the library has I think about 37 um, fine art pieces at the library, plus all the other things that we have from the multicultural collection. Uh, the Ben and Bronze sculptures have little placards talking about them as well, um, and well worth a visit. The website, um, right at this, this website here, you can go and we have interviews with the artist. Um, I think there's seven interviews that have done audio interviews with artists to talk about their work. And again, it's about having this kind of artwork that is so open and free to the public that anybody can come in there, take a look at it. Probably too often people walk by pieces and they don't realize what they're walking by. Um, but there's also a lot of information on our website that you can do that as well. Um, so just to note, some of the, the photos in here uh, that the library doesn't have I'm using those in fair use uh, for the presentation. But if you have any questions on any of the art artwork, you can contact me. Again, I'm not an art historian. Uh, I like photography. But I can certainly find out and do the research. And we, we have enough people at the library who help me put this together, doing the background on the artists that we can figure out, like, what do you need? And get you more information on any of the artists that we have. Great, thank you very much, great. And then we'll have a couple people have questions, somebody in the front, front row. Uh, what kind of a budget do you have either annually or individually? How does it work? This, this art collection was started, I, I believe it was started when the library was built in 2003 or shortly thereafter um, as uh, some of the, uh, people mentioned there was an art committee that helped put together some of the artwork, the acquisitions, and we have a, a separate art fund that is money separate from our regular library budget. Um, so that's one of the things that we're gonna look at. How do we continue to fund that? Could you tell us what the entire uh, collection is worth? Um, I believe the entire collection was appraised just under 900,000. Okay, thank you. And that's one of the challenges with this uh, public art where, as we're having a nice lunch talking about it, you know, how do you manage this kind of artwork, particularly like the Jacob Hashimoto, which is very inviting to little hands. And it's, it's about two feet off the ground at the bottom. And so you'll see some of the little kites will be broken and that's why it was great to have him come in and, and do the repairs himself. Um, but how do we protect that? Uh, the Kehinde Wiley is one that um, we want to be careful of as well. Uh, the Carol Harrison, you know, I had to uh, reach out to some folks in Chicago to do rest restoration work because on the Carol Harrison, it's in the main lobby, lobby there. So you can go in and you sit on the bench and you're sitting right next to it and there were scratches and things like that, words written on there that we needed to clean that up. So part of it's having the public um, this artwork so accessible, but then how do you manage and, and um, make sure we, we're good stewards of the art, the K 
community art collection that we have there. So a little challenging being that open to the public. Before we moved here, uh, we would take art out, rent our, it wasn't rent, it was from the Wheaton Public Library. We could bring art home for uh, 30 days, 60 days. Uh, has that ever been thought about for the Oak Park Library? I've been in libraries um, well over 20 years, and I know when I was at Arlington Heights for many years, they did that as well. Um, part of it's space, figuring out like how do you manage the collection, what's the value of those pieces that you're loaning out. Oak Park is now just looking at doing a different kind of collection that they can check out different things like that. Um, I would say if, if that's something you're interested in, uh, put in a suggestion, they have a contact us, and put in a suggestion and hopefully we can get some of that stuff. I've not had any, uh, heard any conversations about that specifically recently, but as we're looking at building these collections uh, that are more realia and, and less just material like books and things like that, um, that's something that I think is certainly worth considering. Did, did the Oak Park Library System have um, an art collection prior to the 2000s that maybe the pieces were deaccessioned over time or something? Or are there other pieces in the basement that might be yeah. older? That's, it's interesting because since I've been there, it's one of the things I wanted to do was make sure we didn't have anything sitting in hallways that were just collecting dust or getting banged up. Um, so everything the library owns is out open to the public as far as artwork. Um, anything else, we, we had an appraised. If there was any value to it, then we got it out. Um, if, if there was something culturally, like the Ben and Bronze sculpture, the replicas, something culturally that's interesting and engaging, we wanted to get that out into the public. If it was, there was no value to it, we're getting rid of it. And so that was one of the things that we did. So we, everything the library owns is out open and uh, viewable to the public outside of the special collection in that you can come in and set up an appointment. And you can either do that online or call and our archivist, they can work with you to get in there and, and see some of the stuff that we have in there, which is really special. Um, as, to my knowledge, I don't believe there was an art collection before this building went up. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure about the Carl Craft that's over at the maze, but um, I think this was built because of this new big building that went up in 2003. Any further questions? No, if not, then we will have meet you down at tea. Thank you very much. Thank Great. you all for coming. And, and, and again, it, the library is close, and it's anytime we're open, you can go in and do some uh, browsing. And um, you can always reach out to me, and I'm happy to help when I can.